So my team put together this clip of the woman who's going to be running this thing, Nina Jankowicz, which they sometimes they say, don't watch it until the show. Just watch it with the audience. Listen to it for the first time with the audience. And that's going to happen now. This is her singing a song about disinformation. And it's from February 2021. It's how you hide a little, hide a little lie. It's how you hide a little, hide a little lie. It's how you hide a little, hide a little lie. When Rudy Giuliani shared that intel from Ukraine. Or when TikTok influencers say COVID can cause pain. They're laundering disinfo and we really should take note. And not support their lies with our wallet, voice or vote. Oh, information laundering is really quite ferocious. It's when a huckster takes some lies and makes them sound precocious. By saying them in Congress or a mainstream outlet. So yes, information's origin seems slightly less atrocious. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god <laughs> Cheryl, Cheryl did that just happen nutty oh it's just nutty <laughs> with her British accent she's very she's a good little singer I'll give her that uh, and I like her I like her pizzazz her flair um, I really don't want her censoring me because she doesn't seem to have two nickels to rub together in between her ears from the look of it <laughs> I don't you think know, she should be in charge I, of what I say on the internet I'm thinking, Megan, that one of the other big takeaways from this, naming her, naming this agency or whatever it's going to be, it's proof, in my view, what we already knew was that Twitter was acting in that capacity as our other big tech outlets. If Twitter were still acting in that capacity, I don't think we would have seen this rushed, hurried announcement of something mm -hmm. no one's had a chance to look at or really consider. But this is the backup plan with the notion that Twitter's now not going to be able to act is one of the biggest sensors and information shapers that we've had since 2016. The timing is very coincidental, isn't it? I mean, no sooner does Elon announce he's got a deal, then suddenly we get this announcement. And in the midst of Elon's attempt to buy it, we had Barack Obama last week trying to lecture us all on how disinformation is such a huge problem. Purveyor of lie of the year, mind you. Not just little lie, not just occasional lie lie of the year you got to tell a big whopper in order to get that designation that's the man now who was spending his post-presidency lecturing us about disinformation and then the other shoe drops with this announcement post elon's official announcement on monday is it worth backing up just a little bit because I, I dissected this for one of my books the beginning of the notion that someone needed to step in and curate our information is not that old in 2015, there was little to no talk about such things. And in September of 2016 is when this idea was first introduced on the national stage in its current form with fake news in its modern form used by a nonprofit called First Draft, who I learned was actually funded by Alphabet, the parent company of Google, started up at the beginning of the election cycle, generating and creating the notion of fake news. And then within a couple of weeks, Pre then President Obama gave a speech at Carnegie Mellon that said, for the first time I heard anybody say something like this, that somebody needed to step in and start curating our information in this wild, wild west media environment. And I remember at the time, Megan, going, what? Like, no one's asking for that. And slowly, well, actually, rather rapidly, but slowly over time, it's all almost as if we've come to accept that. Instead of we're arguing the terms, instead of arguing that that is, is even done at all, right. that third parties influenced by government and corporations are determining what we can see and hear and think. This is why it's such good news that Elon Musk will be in charge of at least one of these major social media companies. At least there's going to be one where there appears to be somebody who's on the side of free speech running it. And prior to this week, we didn't have that. It's true. And I, I was wondering if you had any recent experiences, because I sure do, with social media. Have they shaped or censored or banned some of the stuff that you've been reporting on and doing interviews about? Well, we had to be very careful with our we interviewed RFK Jr. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we knew very well he, he's been stricken from the Internet. I mean, he's been banned from Twitter and Instagram, Facebook, YouTube. So he's been basically erased. So our goal was to get him on the air in a way that could live. Right. We didn't. It was pointless for us to do an interview with him that would then just get banned. You know what I mean? Like that that's pointless. So we understood we had to be careful with it and we had to sort of cross certain T's. But man, it's like it would have been nice to just have a conversation with, with him without having to worry 
about the censors. You know, I mean, we are kind of getting a little, I don't know, un-American. It's starting to feel a little un-American. Well, this is the goal. And I've talked about this before. The ideal for the propagandists and the censors is we just start censoring ourselves so they don't really even have to step in. Mm -hmm. And I can't tell you how many journalists and news organizations, executives have told me over the past couple of years, they don't publish what they want to publish, even though they believe it's true or a valid viewpoint or a valid scientific study, because they are self-censoring in order to survive on what they see as these powerful platforms that are crucial to them being a thing. They're afraid that if they cross a a certain line and get canceled, as one of them told me, what sort of pyrrhic victory is it to be able to report the truth, but then to be canceled entirely? So here all of us are trying to dance around the truth or certain viewpoints or scientific studies in order to please the censors who are improperly censoring to begin with. And that's a really dangerous place I think we find ourselves in. Mm. Um, my team is reminding me RFK Jr. is on Twitter. It's the one platform he's been allowed to remain on. You know, one of the things that we did to sort of keep the interview up was to put a bunch of links to the CDC, the WHO, all that, you know, at the end of our interview on YouTube. Honestly, Cheryl, I don't care. It's like that doesn't bother me. A lot of our audience is like, oh, what's that doing there? You know, those organizations have lied to us from the beginning. Agreed. I know that. But to me, it seems like a small price to pay to get your interview posted and and to have it remain up on YouTube. I don't own YouTube. I don't have a right to be on YouTube. YouTube has every right to shut me down and say, I don't want you on here. It's not pleasant. I don't want it. I would consider it viewpoint discrimination, but they have every right to do that. So if they're basically going to say, you can put on this guy we think is part of the disinformation dozen, um, and it's it saves my interview to throw a couple links at the end or you know sometimes they throw up the little for information on covid you know you see that at the underneath the the video go to whatever i don't care it's different that's different to me than what you're talking about though where you actually don't ask the tough questions or you steer clear of the third rail subjects because you're afraid for good reason that they're going to shut you down well i agree but think about it you and i both know and i do the same thing When we're posting CDC information, we are posting disinformation in some cases that we know is not true or is Mm -hmm. proven to be inaccurate or or is put out by people who have been sorely misleading, if not entirely wrong. And I've done some expose. I don't know if you interviewed Congressman Massey when he caught CDC and top executives and scientists who he recorded on the phone admitting that they were putting out false information about COVID vaccine being effective in people that had already had COVID. And they admitted this to him and then continued on. So you can only say this is an intentional intent to mislead. Went on to put out in public the same disinformation over and over again after they acknowledged it was untrue. And yet here we are then having to post links to these sources that we know are disproven. For more disinformation. To protect our ability to say things that we believe are true. Inflation is out of control, and one area we see it more than ever is in the grocery store. Even though grocery prices feel like they've doubled, Good ranchers' prices have stayed low and affordable. Once you subscribe, your price never goes up. Your best price is locked in for life. They sell 100% American meat and deliver it to your door for a great price. The problem is 85% of the grass-fed beef in stores and online is imported. Shop Good Ranchers for all of your beef, chicken, and seafood needs, and you know you're buying American. Their beef is prime and upper choice, the two highest grades possible. They sell amazing steaks like ribeyes, T-bones, New York strips, and more. Get steakhouse quality at home with Good Ranchers. Good Ranchers takes the guesswork out of the meat aisle. Having them in your fridge makes mealtime easy, convenient, and less stressful. Plus, their packaging makes it easy to cook what you want and save the rest. Their animals are ethically raised and sustainably sourced. They do things the right way and it shows in every box. Go to GoodRanchers.com slash Megan for $30 off and free express shipping. GoodRanchers.com slash M-E-G-Y-N. Good Ranchers. American meat delivered. And if you don't buy the meat in your house, tell the person who does to check out Good Ranchers. Hey, thanks so much for watching. If you like what you just saw, hit the subscribe button for more clips and full episodes.